I can remember Elizabeth since I was a baby playing that piano. Uh, your, your family has a special place in my family's hearts and my family's uh, circle, and so we thank you for still playing for the Lord. Amen. 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 And so without further ado, our children's story will be brought in by Elizabeth Baeza. So our children, please. Happy Sabbath. Okay, here comes another little one. <laughs> Two. There you go. So I have a question for you. Even the older ones. And that this is gonna be for everybody. I see a little one over there still. It's fine. I see a little one over there, back there. But this story is pretty much for everyone, every single one of us, because the word of God fits everyone, right? Amen. So I have a question. Have you ever felt scared? Have you ever been scared? Yeah? Um, have you ever felt alone? OK. Can, you t can someone tell me? What happened when you felt alone or you felt scared? They're looking at her like she's got a good story. <laughs> right? Tell me about her. <laughs> did, did you lose? Did, did, did you lose somebody? Did you, did you get lost? Did you, okay. There was this one time when I was a kid and there was a dog running after me and I was really scared. Okay, I've been there too. I have been there too. So, um, you know, what about when you're feeling left out at, at school? Because, you know, you see everybody else with friends but you're sitting alone and you're like, you know, I feel left out, right? So, you know, sometimes we just feel alone like nobody cares, right? Or we're lost. What about we, have you ever gotten lost at the store, at the mall from your parents, right? How was that? That was awful. It was really awful. Okay, so what I want you to do right now, I want you to close your eyes. Only the children, only the children, close your eyes. Only the children and imagine that there's a storm outside. Okay, imagine that there's a store and just stand up so they can see you. Everybody close your eyes, close your eyes, don't, pay, don't, okay? Remember, they're starting to rain. Do you hear the storm? Do you hear the rain? Do you hear the thunder? Do you hear the thunder there? Oh, wow, that is pretty scary, isn't it? Okay, you can open your eyes now. I'm gonna tell you something. God has promised us and I want, to, I want to read a couple of, uh, t uh, in Psalms 121, verses 5 and 6, it says, God himself is caring for you. He is your defender. He protects you day and night. He keeps you from all evil and preserves your life. He keeps his eye upon you as you come and go and always guards you. Amen for that, isn't it? Okay, what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna pass out these little beady eyes. Do you see these little beady eyes right here? I'm gonna give you two or three of them. Parents, please be careful with this little eyes. Put them away from the kids so they won't get, you know, they won't put them in their mouths or anything. But what I want you to do is I have homework for the parents, okay? With your kids or your grandparents. What I want you to do is I want you to go home and do a project with these little eyes. Put them on a piece of paper or on a piece of wood and write the text that we just read. Psalm 121, verses 5 and 6. So that they can then keep it in their room, okay? And they can read it whenever they walk by and always remember that God is keeping his very close eye on us to help, help us, okay? Go. Oh, I've got 
Veronica. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna give everybody three eyes, so make sure that everybody gets gets at least three little eyes. Okay. Yeah. Here you go. Don't put it in your mouth. Okay. Now what we're gonna do? Well, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your promises of keeping a watchful eye over us. We claim your promise today in every day of our lives. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And now we'll have a special music by Eliana McEwen.
What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Without further ado, I've seen him preach since I was a baby, too. Uh, he, knows, he doesn't need no introduction, but he's one of the elders at the Spanish Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of our sister churches. Uh, it's Mario Baeza with Standing on the Promises. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, sir. It's good to be here. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Let me just do a little correction on what Daniel just said. But it's uh, Take Up Your Cross. That's what the name of the title is today, the sermon. But again, I'm happy to be here. Praise the Lord. The last time I was here was back in February of 2020. And this morning when I got in my car to come up here, I'm like, let me look at Google Earth. Where is this church at? <laughs> been a while since I've been up here. I missed y'all, but... You know, we know things kind of gone weird on us with all this pandemic stuff. But, hey, we, we weathered it, and here we are, praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? I just wanted to say a little something before I start. Um, I want to take this time to thank each and every one of you for the prayers and the support and the love shown to my family and I during the death of my brother. Thank you so much. Prayers do work. Prayers do uplift the soul. Amen. So thank you so much. Um, I want to touch a little bit about uh, what my wife read about, the eyes of the Lord are upon you. Have you ever been afraid? This is not part of the sermon, it's totally different. But I just wanted to touch on something. Have you ever been afraid? Let me tell you, I was shaking like a leaf on a tree last night. I was scared. My wife came home from work and she tore into me like a wind in a tornado. <laughs> Lord have mercy, I had nowhere to go. But let me tell you, I'm a good woman. I pray the Lord that she keeps me on the straight path. And babe, I appreciate you and I love you for it and thank you. Now, I don't say that a lot, but the verse says, he who finds a good woman has found favor in God. And let me tell you, brothers, that is a very true statement. So thanks. Pray, praise, praise be to God for my wife. Anyway, today's sermon is titled Take Your Cross. And I want to start this morning by asking you guys a question. But before you answer that question, I don't know what the answer is. It's real quick. We're real quick to answer the question. But if we want to go back to the verse that Brother Doty read, which is in Matthew, the book of Matthew, it will be chapter 16, verse 24. And, and it says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, here goes the question. How many of y'all want to follow Jesus? Think about it. Think about it. Before I do, how many of y'all want to follow Jesus? Okay, now I'm going to let y'all answer. How many of y'all want to follow Jesus? Okay. See, I would expect that everybody would say, hey, amen, I want to follow Jesus. Here's the but part about this. It says, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And that is where most of us start having a little bit of an issue. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Kids, how many of y'all want to follow Jesus? day, why do I fight every day to deny myself? If I don't want to follow Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, how many of, how many, let me ask you this, how many disciples do we have here in our congregation today? None? Come on, don't be afraid. Are you, are you all a disciple of Jesus? Are you all followers of Jesus? Okay, guys, you guys are disciples, if you guys are followers of Jesus, then say that you mean it. Yes, I'm disciples. 
example of Jesus? In other words, drive it like you stole it. You want people to put it out there. I am a disciple of Jesus. I love God. And I'm not afraid to say it to anybody. Am I perfect? No, not by any means. But I love Jesus. And when somebody asks you, are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you follow Jesus? A resounding should be, yes, I follow Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. Why? Because his grace has made me perfect. Amen. Deny yourself. What is deny? What is, what is the term deny? Deny says, is described as lose sight of oneself. Lose sight of who you are. I'm going to put this aside because I want to follow Jesus. Because if I want to maintain this, it's going to be very difficult for me to follow Jesus. Why? Because my carnal is going to come out of me. And I'm going to start trying to circumvent, for lack of a better word, my denying myself. Deny yourself. What does it really mean to deny yourself? What did Jesus really mean when he said, deny yourself? And take your cup and cross and follow me. Jesus wasn't talking about a cross, a big wooden cross that you put on your shoulder and you carry it. He wasn't talking about a literal cross. Jesus was talking about the tools, the experiences, the teachings that God's going to use to mold you into looking like Jesus. That is what my brothers and sisters means to take up your cross. But we have to understand one thing. The cross means two things. It means suffering and it means sorrow. And sometimes we think, okay, if I'm going to follow Jesus, why do I have to suffer? And why do I have to be in sorrow? That's what Jesus went through when he took up his cross and denied himself. For who? I'm sorry, say again. One more time, please. He denied himself for us. So, in this morning, brothers and sisters, if Jesus took up his cross and denied himself for me, why is it so hard for me to deny myself for him? Okay, so it was Jesus. So, so he was God's son. It wasn't no big of a deal for him. Wrong. It was an extremely hard deal for him. I want you to go with me if you brought your Bibles to the book of Hebrew. The book of Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 7. And listen to what it says about Jesus. It says, during the days of Jesus, Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent, what? Submission. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He learned obedience from what he suffered. Through reverent submission. Through offering up loud cries and tears. Go back to uh, Hebrew 2, verses 10 and 11. Go back a couple of pages. Verse number 10. In bringing many sons to glory... It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of, those, of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. It says the author of their salvation was made perfect through suffering. Suffering and sorrow has an important part in our Christian life. Because we need to learn to deny ourselves. If Jesus, the Son of God, went through all this suffering, through all this sorrow, then what keeps me from going through suffering and through sorrow for him? I, I'm saddened for the kids in this day and age because they're... They go through so much stuff more than what we knew we were Kids, I know you guys go through hard stuff at school and friends. There's so much pressure. 
of to conform yourselves to the ways of the world. There's so much pressure that your friends who don't understand what you believe or where you come from, well, you're kind of weird. Why do you believe that? And sometimes we find ourselves battling that. But do not ever forget what you've been taught. Don't forget that. Now, Jesus suffered, carried the cross for you and I. Us, students, the student is not above his, math, his master. So if Jesus suffered for me, why can I not suffer for him? Don't, let's not take this suffering as something that is a penitence that is going to keep me downtrodden. That's going to keep me down and make me feel like, why do I have to put up with all this suffering? Jesus, in his love and mercy for us, because he wants to commune with us face to face in that final day. He suffered for us. And I think it is something that we must do is suffer for him. Now, if we go to the book of John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, we have the crowd of people following Jesus, and Jesus fed them. And the following morning, the same crowd of people came back looking for Jesus, looking for breakfast, looking for some food. And, and in talking to them, Jesus preached one of the most powerful sermons to all those people. And he said to them, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no part with me. John chapter 6. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no part with me. And a lot of the people who were there that day, they said, this is hard to hear. Those are hard words. And 4,988 people turned around and left. Only 12 remained. And Jesus asked Peter, do you want to go with them too? And Peter said, no, master. Why would I want to go with them? You have the words of life. For those 4,988 people, it was hard for them to deny themselves and follow the master. Peter said it clearly. No, master, we're not going to leave. You have the words of life. It is until we understand the essence of a discipleship, we finally understand that there's no place else for us to go other than to Jesus. That is the essence of the discipleship. When Jesus picked up the cross, where did he go? To Skull Mountain, to Golgotha. What did he do there? He died. For who? For you and me. In the book, The Cost of the Discipleship, it sums it up this way. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Jesus is calling us today to take up our cross and follow him. There is not one cross we carry throughout our lifetime. We carry many crosses. And during the crosses that we carry during our spiritual journal, that cross is made specifically and specially custom made for you. You don't carry a cross like I do, and I don't carry a cross like you do. Your cross is made custom made for you by the Holy Spirit. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit knows the needs that you have. It knows the needs that I have. And therefore, the cross that I'm going to carry is custom made for me. I cannot carry yours, and you cannot carry mine. But there are three things that we want to learn about dying on the cross today. I want to share those with you. You see, dying on the cross hurts. Dying on the cross takes time. And there's no such thing as self-crucifixion. Dying on the cross hurts. Dying on the cross takes time. And there's no such thing as self-crucifixion. You see, there's no doubt that God can use a man greatly. But first, he must hurt him deeply. There is, and I'm going to say it again. And, and when I say man, please understand it's man and woman. But it says there's no doubt. There's no doubt that God can use any one of us greatly for his purpose. But first, he must hurt us deeply. 
And he would say, so why, why must I get hurt deeply to be used? Oh, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, self is very, very selfish. Have y'all ever seen how they temper steel? They take a piece of steel and they stick it into the fire until it becomes red, cherry red. They take it out of the fire and they dump it into a receptacle full of oil and brine. And you can hear the steel screaming because it's being tempered. And it's not until it's tempered that it's, being, that it's ready to be used for whatever is needed. I don't know if y'all ever seen the, the, the show on the History Channel called Forged in Fire. It is a very way, very true way of looking how you temper steel. Because at the end of when they get done making their knives or swords or whatever they're making, their purpose is to, to strengthen the blade for its, per, for its use. And they put that blade, let me tell you, through a bunch of rigorous uh, uh, exercises to make sure that the blade is hardened the right way. And if it's not hardened the right way, if it fails, you fail. So that is the same thing that God does with us. He'll take us, because why? Because he has a special place for us. He says God loves his special children so much. He loves us so much that he's going to take us and he's going to stick us into the crucible. The Lord's crucible. And he's going to apply fire to us. And what is the temperature he's going to use? His love. And he's going to apply that fire. And he's going to apply it until we become red. And then he's going to take us out. And it's not until we get hardened, tempered like steel, that is, we are able to be used for God's purpose. The goldsmith will take a piece of gold and he'll put it into the crucible and stick the fire to it. And gold, once you, you're melting it, the impurities will rise to the top. The gold, which is heavier, goes to the bottom. And then the goldsmith scrapes away all the impurities. And the more they come up, the more he scrapes away. And it's not until he sees himself in the gold that he can say, this gold is pure. So in a similar fashion, the Lord's going to stick us, kids, us adults, into the crucible. And it's going to take away all of our impurities, all our selflessness, our selfishness, all our egos, all our hatred, Everything that does not need to be there, he's going to take it away. He's going to cl clear it, clean it, skim it off the top. And when the Lord finally looks down there and he sees his image in you, this one he says, now I'm ready to use you. There is a process why we get stuck, we, get, we go through the crucible. That's why we suffer, that's why we go through a whole bunch of trials and tribulations in life. Why? Because the Lord wants his precious children to be ready for him. To be used for his purpose. It is not because he does it for hate. He does it out of love. But one thing that we have to know here, brothers and sisters, this morning we talked about a little bit about that. God is not going to force anybody into the crucible who does not want to be there. This is all done out of love. Do you want to be there? Do you want to come to the Lord? Do you want to deny yourself and you want to say, Jesus, here I am. Use me for whatever you need to use me. And he's going to say, yes, I'm going to use you, my son. But first, I must hurt you. First, I might take, I'm, I must have to take all that stuff out of you that's going to prohibit you from me using you the way I want to use you. There's a reason why he does that. And that's why the cross hurts. Why? Because we have to be putting aside the things that we love. We have to put aside the things that keep us from the Lord. Those little sins that we love to, 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 to cherish. Those things that keep us away. And this could be anything. It could be anything. It could be hatred. It could be self. I'm, I'm so proud of myself. It could be pride. It could be whatever is keeping you. From the master seeing himself in you. That's why we go through the Lord's crucible. And don't find it hard. Don't, don't get discouraged brothers and sisters. Because God wants to perfect his saints. Amen. God wants to perfect his kiddos. Let me ask you this. 
You see, a lot of people, Martin, let, us, let me ask the question first. How many saints do we have here today? One amen. What do you think when you talk about a saint? If I say, are y'all saints? What is your response going to be? Yeah. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of, <laughs> let's see, there's some, am I a saint? I don't know. Hmm. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Being a saint doesn't mean you have a halo over your head. How many believers do we have here? Amen. Let me ask that again. How many believers do we have here? Amen. How many of you Jesus died and rose and saved you? You almost kind of got me over the hump. I almost kind of need you. Because you're like, well, well, amen. But I told you earlier, when somebody tells you or asks you that, you have to be assured of yourself. And that's one problem that a Christian person has. We seem to kind of take away what Jesus did for us. And, and, and we put it on ourselves. Am I a Christian? Well, well. You heard me the way I talk, I don't think I'm a Christian. But you have to understand that Christ lived, died, resurrected to save us. If you believe that, brothers and sisters, then again, mean it. This is what I believe. This is what I know Jesus did for me. Don't be ashamed of it. Amen. Don't be ashamed of it. Because why? Because that's what he did. Don't discount what Jesus did for us. Don't put, your, don't put yourself in a position that says, okay, I'm not that good of a person, so I don't think Jesus died for me. Jesus didn't die for the good people. He died for the sinners. Amen. Let me ask the question the other way around. How many sinners do we have here? Amen. Amen. Everybody said amen. You see how it works? I'm a sinner. How many saints? <laughs> not me. I'm not a saint. You see, a saint is a believer. And if you believe God died and rose for you, then you are a saint. Let me ask a follow-up question. How many of y'all have the mind of Christ? Amen. Amen. We're getting there. You see, again, we people think, I don't have the mind of Christ because I'm not Jesus. Let me ask y'all this. How many of y'all pray for, for yourselves? Amen. How many of y'all pray for your brothers and sisters? Amen. How many of y'all take a plate of food to a needy brother? Amen. How many of y'all pay your tithe? Amen. How many of y'all give to help spread the gospel? Amen. How many of y'all pray for each other? Amen. Isn't that not what Jesus did? Amen. So the question again is, how many of y'all got the mind of Christ? Amen. 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 Exactly. You see, I got caught up in the exact same thing when they asked me that question one day, several years ago. They said, hey, Mario, do you got the mind of Christ? I'm like, are you crazy? Me, the mind of Christ? But it was not until they put it in that context <laughs> that I understood the mind of Christ. It doesn't have to be that I got to be perfect. It only implies that you do what the Lord asks you to do. Why? Because you think like because you pray for your brothers and sisters. Because you give of yourself. <clears throat> because you want to be involved in preaching the gospel. That is what Jesus did. That is what it means having the mind of Christ. Dying on the Christ, brothers and sisters, hurts. And I'll give a short illustration. If you go to the book of uh, uh, First Kings, chapter 17, it talks about Elijah the Tishbite. Very first verse. And Elijah the Tishbite. If you go 24 verses down, it says Elijah the man of God. Hmm. What happened in those 24 verses that Elijah went from Elijah the Tishbite to Elijah the man of God? You see, throughout Elijah's life, you think God just chose him and he said, Elijah, you're going to do this for me. God had to put Elijah through a process so that when he was ready to be used, that is why Elijah was able to call down the fire at Mount Carmel. Why? Because by this time, God had already cut him, had already stuck him through the crucible, and had already molded him and tempered him. 
for his purpose. We're dead, brothers and sisters. We're sitting here today. And, and, and God is going to use you to go from regular, I'm a regular member of the Seventh-day Adventist church sitting on the bench on a Saturday morning to I am a member of Seventh-day Adventist church preaching the word of God. To I'm a member who's taking the word to somebody else. A while ago, Daniel asked for a special prayer prayer, and for, for a, a offering for a young lady or for some people who were going through some hard times. And I saw a lot of people giving. Why? Because you have the mind of Christ. Amen. It is not because of me, because my selfish would have said, let's see here, I've got this bill to pay, I've got this bill to pay, and I've got this bill to pay, so I don't have enough to pay. That is what selfishness does to you. But when you have the mind of Christ, it's a totally different thing. You have to, we have to know, brothers and sisters, that God was refining Elijah for his own purpose. And that's why when you die on the cross, is a process that you're going through. It says God ruthlessly perfects the ones that he elects. It says that he hammers him and he hurts him and his mighty blows convert him. God is wailing away on you. Don't fight it because he's trying to perfect you. Because why? Because he chose you. He chose us to do a special purpose for him. That is what God is doing for us. Kids, whenever you find yourself struggling with your friends, never forget what you've been taught. Don't let your friends help make you forget what you've been learned. Always keep what your mama and daddy have taught you, what you've learned here in church. That is part of the crucible that the Lord will put you through. The crucible, again, brothers and sisters, dying on the cross, takes it hurts another thing i want to want to touch base is dying on the cross takes time you know it's been said that back in the time when they were crucifying people some people would take longer to die on the cross some would take a few hours some would take a couple of days but let me tell you something when god is putting us through the crucible okay sometimes we say we get wrapped up in ourselves and we say well i've been a christian for let's see huh, here i am um 15 years and I'm still struggling. Or I've been a Christian for 20 years and I'm still struggling. Or I've been a Christian all my life and I'm 75 years old and I'm still struggling. How many of y'all ever heard the Rome wasn't built in a day? The perfection of God and his people takes time. He who started the work in you will complete it. Don't give up. Don't feel like I've, I've been doing this forever. I'm still, I feel like I'm still in the same place. So let me tell you a little bit about Moses. When God woke up to Moses and he said, Moses, I need you to take my people out of Egypt. You know what he said? I'm ready to go. Let's go do it. And what did he do on the first day on the job? He killed an Egyptian. And he took off running. And for the next 40 years, he wandered out in the wilderness while God was waiting for him. And at the age of 80, God approached him again. Moses, I need to go take my kids, my people out of Egypt. What did he say? Are you kidding me, Lord? You want me to do what? And what was the Lord's response? I've got you right where I need you. Why? Because I need you to understand one thing, Moses. The people will be delivered by my power, not by yours. Amen. Amen. And it took him 40 years to realize that. It took Moses 40 years to realize that. And at 80 years of age, he was doomed. He could have done it 40. Don't be, don't cut yourself out because you're 75 years old and you're still struggling. It took Moses 80 years to know that. You're 25 years old, 15 years old, 10 years old, 21 years old, and you're still struggling. Don't cut yourself out of the game. God is working for eternity not for the moment. Amen. And he's going to take his time. God's timing is perfect. It is perfect. So t God is going to take his time to shape you. And until you can put your self-confidence away, 
it's not going to be until that's when God can use you. Because we ourselves, when God sets us aside, he wants us to put away our self-confidence. He wants us to put away what we are. Me, me, me. There's a song that says, all eyes on me. Why? What am I? All eyes on me. Kids, it's not all eyes on you. It's all eyes on the Lord. The Lord will look down upon you with favor. But we have to know that if we surrender to him, if we take up our cross, if we deny ourselves, until then is when God can start using me and using us. We have to know that, brothers and sisters, because if we don't, we're never going to understand the message. Dying on the cross takes time. You pick up your cross, it's going to hurt. You're going to carry your cross, it's going to take time. Why? Because God has a special place for us. And again, I want to reiterate and keep in mind that whatever you carry, whatever cross you have, is not the same as mine. Some people can say, well, man, look at the guy over there. He lives a life like he doesn't care about anything. We don't know that. Look at brother so-and-so. I wish I had a life like him. We don't know what he's gone through. Look at sister so-and-so. Look at the pastor. Man, he's just easy going like nothing bothers him. We don't know. Because his cross is totally different than my cross. And last but not least, brothers and sisters, no one can crucify themselves. Crucifixion is God's job, not mine. God, we don't, we don't know. We cannot self-engineer a journey and say, okay, this is the way my Christian life is going to go. And it's going to be great. I'm going to tell you by personal experience. I, uh, my wife and I were married for... 15, 16 years. We, before we got married, we said to ourselves, we planned this, okay? We don't want any kids, great. And for the first 15 years of my marriage, great. And all of a sudden, boom, one day I got a seven-year-old boy. I didn't plan for that. My plans were, did not include a seven-year-old boy. My plans didn't include coming home and helping to help with homework. My plans didn't include coming home and helping to help with getting him ready and getting him supper and, and, and bathing him and all that. Never. You see, so don't plan your life. Don't plan your spiritual journey on yourself. Because when you put yourself in God's hands, God's going to say, it's time to take a right turn. And let me tell you, it's been... A journey. And today that young man is 21 years of age. And he sits here with us today. Amen. Praise the Lord. It was, has it been easy? No. It's not been easy. But I wouldn't trade it for the world. Because I've learned that the Lord has a spe specific way for me. A specific way for my wife. For our family. So don't go out and plan and say, this is the way I want to be. My brother Scott getting married here pretty soon. And I know you and your fiance have planned things. And it's some good and good and well planned. Nothing wrong with it. But when you put your plans in God's hands, God's gonna say, take out the big eraser, erase that, erase that, erase that, and erase that. I don't like that part of your plan. This is where you're gonna go. And when we put ourselves in God's hands, everything works for good for those who love the Lord. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you cannot crucify yourself. And until you, the purpose of God is to bring you to being a mature Christian fighting warrior for him. And when I mean mature, I'm not talking about an age. I'm talking about a spiritual fight. God wants you for a specific purpose. And he's going to work you. And he's going to mold you. And he's going to do everything he can to shape you for his purpose. The question right now, my brother and sister, is this. Again, I'm going to tell you, dying on the cross hurts. Dying on the cross takes time. And no one can self-crucify you. Now, how many of y'all are ready to die on the cross? It causes you to think. It causes you to think. How many of y'all, how many of us are ready to die on the cross? 
You see, we can all say all day long, I'm a follower of Jesus. But dying on the cross? Ooh, hold on. Let's, let's, let's discuss that. See, because it's going to cause pain and it's going to cause sorrow. And it's going to cause me to leave away, put away the things that I love. It's going to cause myself to put it down. It's going to have to, I'm going to have to let God break me down to build me back up. How many of y'all have ever seen a, a, a documentary of the Marine training? Let me tell you, those poor people, Lord have mercy. The whole purpose of the Marine training is to break you down as a civilian. Take everything out of you as a civilian and build you back up as a Marine. And let me tell you, what they go through, huh, I won't be part of the Marine, no way. But there's people who do. And they tell them, this is what is going to take you to be part of the Marines. Are you in for the challenge? Oh, yes, I am. But as the training goes on, some people view or drop me on request. And some people stay in the Marines until they get done. And then they can say, you burn your shield. You are now a United States Marine. The same, similar, the same thing God is doing to us today. He's going to say, son, do you want to follow me? Yes, I do. And I'm going to stick you to the crucifix. And I'm going to burn you. And I'm going to cut you. And I'm going to break you down. But I'm going to build you up. Why? Because I have a specific purpose for you. I want to finish with this illustration. There was a man, a king in a western kingdom who had a beautiful garden. And he loved to walk among the garden to hear the birds sing, to see the beautiful flowers, to feel the wind blowing the breeze. And in this garden, he had a bamboo tree, the most beautiful bamboo tree he had ever had. It was in the middle of the garden. And he had a special affinity for this bamboo tree. And he would walk up to the bamboo tree every day and he'd look at this bamboo tree and just one day, as he was walking up to the bamboo tree, he stood there in front of him. Keep in mind, this is just a story. And the bamboo tree bent down and honored his master. And he said, Master, I am your bamboo tree. I am the most beautiful bamboo tree you have. Use me for whatever you want to. The master said, my beautiful bamboo tree, if I'm going to use you for my purpose, I'm going to have to cut you down. No, 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 don't cut me down. I have to cut you down. If I'm going to use you for my purpose. Okay, then cut me down. So the, the master cut down the bamboo tree. And he laid it down. And he said, bamboo tree, I love you so much, but i got to cut off all your branches. What do you mean, master? You've already cut me down. Why do you want to cut off my branches? Because then you're not going to be useful to me. And all of a sudden, the birds stop singing. The wind stopped blowing. And the master went about his business and he chopped off all the leaves off his bamboo tree and he laid him down nothing but a beam that laid. And the, the bamboo tree said, Master, you've already cut me down. You've already cut my branches. Now what? And the master said, Bamboo tree, I've got to do one more thing. I've got to split you in half. He said, What? You're going to split me in half? Yes, because you're still useless to me. I gotta split you in half. And not only am I gonna split you in half, I gotta hollow you out. I gotta rip your heart out. And the bamboo tree said, No, Master, what do you mean? You've already cut me down. You've already cut my branches. You said I was the most beautiful bamboo tree in your garden. And now you wanna split me in half and take my heart out? Yes, I do. So the master proceeded to cut him in half, split him open, hollow him out. And after he hollowed him out, the master grabbed that half of bamboo tree and he put it up on a spring of fresh water and stuck it under the spring and the bamboo tree was able to feed water all the other rest of the plants in the, in the garden. And the birds were singing again and the wind was blowing again and everybody was happy again. Why do I tell you this? Because we brothers and sisters, are the most beautiful bamboo tree in God's garden. And God is telling you today, my beautiful bamboo tree, I love you. 
And you're saying, Lord, here I am. Use me. But then God's going to say, my beautiful bamboo tree, I'm going to have to cut you down, and I'm going to have to split you in half. And all those branches that he wants to remove from us is all our worldly desires. Everything that gives us joy. Everything that is for self, for me, 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 me. And the Lord wants to cut all this stuff away from me and take it away. And then when he splits me in two and rips my heart out and puts him in his purpose, that is what God wants to do with us. Dying on the cross hurts. Dying on the cross takes time. And you cannot do this on your own. You have to let the master of the garden come up to you and cut you down and split you in half and hollow you out so he can use you. And it's until then, until we surrender to God, is when we, when God can say, now you are useful to me. Now I've taken all the way, everything that Mario likes, everything that Mario does, all the worldly desires, I've taken them out. Today the Lord is calling you. Are you ready to die on the cross? Are you ready to take up your cross and follow me? Are you ready to deny yourself? It is a hard question. And it's something we got, we got to think about. But we said this morning, if I want to reclaim God's promises, if I want to be part of God's kids, part of God's kingdom, I have to accept the consequences. I have to accept that this is what God wants to do with me then. I have to pick up my cross. I have to deny myself. And I'm going to say, Jesus, I will follow you. Brother and sister, God never said, Jesus never said, Christianity is going to be an easy road. Oh, no. He never said that. Because if what, you know what? If it was that easy, this church and all the other, other churches today would have been full. ready to take up your cross, if you're ready to deny yourself, if you're ready to walk, if you're ready to be put into the Lord's crucible and let him melt you and form you, I want to invite you to come up here because I want to pray for all of us. Brothers, let me tell you something. I myself am going to the crucible every day and I pout and I, and I get angry, but I know the Lord has a purpose and I accept the purpose. Father, Lord, before you, before this pulpit, Lord, we are standing here, and we are your kids, and we suffer, we go through suffering, we go through sorrow, but by your grace, your love and mercy, Lord, we stand here before you today, because you promised us that if you was to put us through the crucible to shape us for your purpose, Lord, you would be with us. And Lord, for that we thank you. Because we know 
that you have not abandoned us. We know that you have been with us. We know that with every mighty blow that we take, <coughs> it is the master who is shaping us. It is the master who is cutting away things that should not be in our lives. Whether it be anger, whether it be pride, whether it be self-indulging, whether it be drugs, alcohol, porn, whatever, Lord, wild desires, whatever it may be, Lord, we know that you are working to hammer all that junk out of our lives, Lord, to take all the impurities out until you can see yourself in us. Oh, Father, I pray for myself. I pray for all my brothers and sisters here. I pray for all the children here, Lord. I pray for all the visitors here, for each and every member of this church, for the pastor. I pray for everybody, Lord, that we can allow ourselves, that we can deny ourselves, that we can carry the cross, that we can allow ourselves to go through your crucible because you're going to put us through that, Lord. And the thermometer that you're going to use is going to be your love. Because the end result is that one day, after you purify us, Lord, after you perfect us, Lord, one day we will sit together and we can hold hands with you and see you face to face, Lord. Brother, for, Lord, for everything that my brothers and sisters are going through, we put ourselves in your hand, Lord. We put ourselves in your hands so that you can mold us and chisel away everything that is keeping us from you, Lord. Lord, we cannot hurry this process, but we can sure stop it by walking away. But we don't want to do that, Lord. We want you to continue your work in us, Lord, because we know the promise you gave us. He who started a good work in us will see it to completion. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and mercy. And we put ourselves in your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Sing song, let us all stand and sing hymn number 518. 518, standing on the promises.
Oh, I love that because it says standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. Oh, let me tell you, the storms of doubt and fear assail us every day. But we take stands in the promises that cannot fail. Brothers and sisters, we have a great God. And the only way we're going to make it through this is if we remain steadfast on those promises. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your love, your kind, kindness, your grace, your grace and your mercy, Lord. Father, thank you for the many promises you've given us. That when the, when the, when the fear, when the doubt, when all this stuff assails, there is a promise that will never fail. And that is that you will be with us no matter what. Father, we put ourselves in your hand. We put ourselves in your hands, the hands of the master. And if you have to apply fire to us, Lord, to burn away all the impurities, Lord, we welcome that, Lord, because we know you have a special purpose for us, Lord. And we know what your purpose is, Father. I ask for each and every one of my brothers and sisters here this morning, I ask that you be with them, Lord. Whatever cross they have to bear, assure them that they are not bearing it alone. Oh, Father, thank you for the many blessings, for the many promises that you've given us. As we exit your church, Lord, today, we ask that you be with us, that you bring us back here to continue to praise you together as a group. But at home, in the solitude of our house, May we also put time aside to be with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.